Would you like to buy the Chicago Cubs from Zanzel? And, and my question is, do you think uh, buying baseball teams is a good investment? Well, it's been a good investment. It's been a good investment. It's not been a good investment necessarily because the earnings have gone up so much, although cable television multiplied uh, the value in a big way. Uh, in effect, television expanded the stadium. Wrigley Field, I think, probably seats less than 40,000 maybe. So you had 40,000 seats available when I went there for my first Major League Baseball game in 1939. But then along came television and then cable television and pay, pay um, uh, in effect, pay cable television for baseball or sports networks. And that multiplied the seats in a huge way. Now, a lot of that went to the players, uh, but some of it stuck to the owners. Uh, I am not a, when I was, when I was your age, uh, I would have thought if I made a lot of money, I would have bought a team. Uh, but there were a lot of things I thought I would do then that I haven't done subsequently. So uh, I don't think, if the Cubs sell for 700 million uh, and you've got uh, a percentage of that in your bank account now, I don't think I would buy in at, at that price. Uh, there's a psychic income to many people in owning sports teams. I mean, it makes them famous, maybe not in the way they anticipated when they bought the team, but the you know, it, it is a way to instant celebrity and recognition and all that. And as long as pe we live in a society where people have loads and loads of money, uh, a certain percentage of people are going to want to become known for the fact that they have done very well in life. And a sports team is certainly one way of doing it. That isn't the only reason people buy them, obviously. But I will say this. You are not the first one that's asked me about buying the Cubs. We've <laughs> I've had calls from, not from Sam, but from other people and... It's, uh, I think I'll leave that to you. <laughs> Charlie, okay. are you thinking about buying a sports team? <laughs> he would be a tougher sell than I would. I, I, I might do something kind of stupid like that, but. <laughs> well, you've already done it once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> Number 10. <laughs> the most important investment you can make is in yourself. I mean, very, very, very few people get anything like their potential horsepower translated into the actual horsepower of their output in life. And, and uh, every, potential exceeds realization to just an enormous factor with so many people. And I, one, one illustration you might try with your class, I tell them this when I talk to high school groups. I, just imagine that you're 16 and I was going to give you a car of your choice today, any car you wanted to pick. And, but there was one catch attached to it. It was the only car you were going to get in the rest of your life. So you had to make it last there. You can pick out the fanciest one you want, a Maserai, whatever it might be. How would you treat it? Well, of course you would read the owner's manual about five times before you turned the key in the ignition. You'd keep it garaged. Any little rust you would get taken care of immediately. You'd change the oil twice as often as you were supposed to because you know it it has to last a lifetime. And then I tell the students, and you get one body and one mind, and uh, it's gonna have to last you a lifetime, and you better treat it the same way, and you better start treating it right now, because it doesn't do you any good to start worrying about that when you're 50 or 60, and the rust, that little speck of rust has turned into something big. So anything your students do to invest in their mind and body, uh, particularly your mind, <laughs> We didn't work too hard on the bodies around here, but <laughs> you know it, it pays off. It pays off in an extraordinary way. Your your best asset is your own self, and you can become, to an enormous degree, the person you want to be. Uh, when I get classes in universities, I just ask them to imagine they were going to buy one of their classmates to own 10% of for the rest of their life. Which one would they pick? They wouldn't pick the one with the highest IQ or the, uh, necessarily the one with the highest grades. They pick the person that's gonna be effective. And the reason people are effective is because other people wanna work with them. They wanna, they wanna be around them. And other people, they don't wanna be around. And those are qualities that an individual picks up, being generous, being humorous, being on time, doing, not claiming 
credit for more than you do, but rather than less than you, helping out other people, all kinds of human qualities that turn other people on, and then there's things that turn on people off. And those are habits, and they're the habits that you pick up when they're the age of your students. The habits they have today will follow them throughout life, so why not have good ones? So that's the only message I would give your students. <laughs> well, I've got a, a specific suggestion that answers your specific question. I would add to that extensive repertoire of yours by teaching them to avoid being manipulated to their disadvantage by vendors and by lenders using the standard tricks of the vendor and uh, lender trade. And you couldn't start with a better book than Cialdini's Influence. And I think Bob Cialdini, who's a shareholder, is here somewhere in this audience. And uh, so I have a new textbook to, that I suggest you add to your class, which is Cialdini's Influence. And he's just got a new book that's coming out and for sale in Omaha today, I think, for the first time. And that's called Yes. So here's two books that I suggest you add to your class. Americans at the individual, municipal, state, and federal levels historically do not save. On the other hand, Asians save approximately 40% of their income. Living beyond one means is an American way that obviously cannot continue. First, why is it that Americans do not save? And secondly, what can we do to correct this long-term problem? Thank you. Yeah, well, certainly the savings rate in this country is, has fallen significantly and may even be negative, although I, it does seem to me that the value of the country uh, in real terms, I think, does increase quite significantly decade to decade. So I'm not sure exactly how it happens without savings, but it, it does seem to me that, that this country as a whole is worth considerably more than it was 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years ago in real terms. So something good has happened. But the, uh, the propensity to save, it almost seems innate in at least the great majority of cases. I mean, we've got uh, our friend from Florida teaching children to save, and I think that it has some impact. And uh, I, mean, I should have thanked Andy Hayward for that terrific cartoon this morning, and, and he's got a program that I'm participating in that we think in cartoon form will might influence a few younger people towards saving. Uh, if you own Berkshire stock, you're automatically saving because we retain earnings and your indirect interest uh, in those retained earnings is a form of saving. So you can, you can spend every dollar of your income that comes in the other way and if you own Berkshire you are net saving, which is a practice I've now been following for 43 years, uh, sometimes in my family's consternation. The, uh, I don't, I don't know that the, you know, the savings rate is based on calculations made on, on consumption and imports and so on. And uh, we are importing $700 billion more of goods and services than we're exporting, and that means that somebody else is doing our savings for us, basically, as we, as we uh, export ownership and claims against uh, America. Uh, I think that's going to have consequences over time, but we are so rich that uh, it may not be really apparent. I, don't, I think the average American standard of living is going to improve in real terms, although I think it may be very, very, very disproportionate uh, the extent to which the, particularly the super rich, uh, benefit compared to those in the middle class. But net, I think the, company, the country will be, even with our present policies, our, the net re, in net real terms, the, uh, the value uh, on a per capita basis of the country will increase from decade to dec decade, but nothing like it will in places like uh, China or Korea, percentage-wise, where the savings rate is very high. Uh, this country may not save very much because it may not need to save very much. We have $47,000 of GDP per capita. That 
It may not be distributed very well, but we are one very, very, very rich country. And a, a very rich country may not need to save as much as a, as a country that's trying to reach its potential. Charlie? Uh, I've got nothing to add to that. Okay, number 11. Mr. Buffett, Mr. Munger. This sounds My serious. My name <laughs> is... <laughs> I'm used to that. My name is Ute Bader from Munich. Again, a guy from Germany. <laughs> We're going to meet in around about 14 days' time again in Germany, in Frankfurt at the Union Club. May I ask you, a little bit ahead of the others, what are your reasons for coming to Germany? Thank you. Yeah, it's very simple. We want more, not that there have been hardly any so far, but we would, we would like more family owners of German businesses, some cases in the family, maybe 100 years, maybe 20 years, whatever it might be. We want more owners who, when they feel some need to monetize their business, think of Berkshire Hathaway. We want to be on their radar screen. We want to be in the same position. We want them to be in the same position that the Wertheimer family was, or Paul Andrews family was here not so long ago, or the Pritzker family was, when they have some reason, there could be a variety of them, that they want to convert a, the ownership of a good, very good company about which they care a great deal, translated into, uh, into money to think about calling us. Uh, and if they care about their business, we are their best call. Uh, and I don't think we're anywhere near as prominent on the radar screen in Germany as we are in the United States. And that's something I probably should have done more about earlier. But now I'm going to hit four countries in Europe in a few weeks. And, and when we leave, I think we'll be somewhat better known what we're looking for, what we can do for those companies, why they should give us a call, I think we'll be better known a month from now than we are now. Charlie? Yeah, and Germany is a particularly advanced civilization in terms of inventiveness and engineering. You go into an American printing plant now, and the names on, on the machines are all German. Not, not all, but mostly. Now, some of the German names are Germans who came over here to America and formed printing equipment businesses. But it's just amazing the influence that the, the Germans have had on field after field in America. It's a very logical place for us to be looking. Sounds like maybe Charlie should go. <laughs> Number 12. 